Okay, this is part um, five, the last part, conclusion of book review of Start Solution by Dr. John McDougall. Okay, and I got the page numbers here, page 134. Calorie for calorie, fake foods are not much better nutritionally than the animal foods they replace. So yeah, he goes into a little more detail, but the bottom line, you want to avoid all the processed foods. Um, and that's a subject we could go into in much more detail, which we're not going to, but he points out there's a bunch of problems with it. And the closer you look at processed food, the worse it gets. Okay, uh, page 133, vegetable oils often contribute even more than animal fats to promoting cancer. Yeah, it's pretty widely known that animal foods increase cancer risk, but he points out that uh, vegetable oils are even worse. Okay, and if you look at blood sludge, vegetable oils had even more prolonged blood sludging than a, did a meal of animal foods, okay, the, the omega-6 cooking oils, for example. Okay, a fat is a fat is a fat. And again, that's kind of like the uh, Nathan Pritikin, fat is bad. So Dr. McDougal was strongly influenced by Nathan Pritikin, and I also agreed. Nathan Pritikin was a genius. I, I, that guy really was trying to get to the truth of problems, and McDougall thinks a lot like Pritikin in the sense that they put a lot of blame on uh, dietary fat for causing hypertension. Um, Dr. McDougall puts much less emphasis on sodium. He even says that he thinks sodium and sugar are scapegoated for a lot of the problems in the Western diet. And the main problem is really the animal protein and the animal fat, or the fat and the, the fat in general, you know, both sat fat from animals and the oils, typically omega-6s especially. Okay, so that's a little different, though, than some people who feel that the sodium is a major contributor. He sees sodium and simple sugars, you know, like just table sugar, white sugar, as being relatively minor problems. Okay, um, serial angiograms. This is like the David Blankenthorn study. Serial angiograms of the heart, of a human heart arteries over a year, showed that all three types of fat, sat fat, which is, you know, animal fat, saturated fat, MUFA, monounsaturated fatty acid, typically olive oil, and PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acid, your omega-3s and omega-6 oils, were all associated with significant increases in new atherosclerotic lesions. That's an important point, <clears throat> that all fat is bad for metabolic health. And McDougall knew that, Pritikin knew that, <clears throat> I talk about that as well. But usually you'll run into, when you get outside of the low-fat community, <clears throat> people will try to tell you, oh, these are good fats, olive oil, omega-3, soy, and all this stuff. I, I disagree with that, okay? And I think Ms. Dr. McDougall also disagrees with that. I maybe come down a little more strongly on it than he would, but, you know, it's obvious when you look closer, there's problems with all these fats. And like I said, Pritikin figured this out a long time ago. Okay, the next thing, this is Dr. McDougall. He says, decreasing total fat intake is the only way to stop the lesions from growing, the coronary artery atherosclerotic lesions. That's an important statement. Decreasing total fat intake was the only way to stop the lesions from growing. And I can tell you, I just reviewed the lectures of Lydia Lynch, the Harvard immunologist, and she said every single type of fat they fed to the mice all made the mice get fatter. It didn't matter which fat type it was. Every single type of fat they fed to the mice all had an immune suppression effect. Um, Okay, so then uh, Dr. McDougall continues, decreasing fat, I know I'm repeating myself, but this is an important statement. Decreasing total fat intake was the only way to stop the lesions from growing. And, you know, William Roberts, you feed a high-fat diet to uh, herbivores and to humans, they all get atherosclerosis, okay? There's been studies where you reduce dietary fat dramatically and you get a, you get a halt in the progression of atherosclerosis and often some reversal, like the Esselstyn data. Okay, uh, Dr. McDougall continues. One of the most important predictors of heart attack risk is elevated level of factor seven. It's factor seven is one of the clotting factors in the blood. Uh, formation of clots inside the arteries causes most heart attacks and strokes. Olive oil increases blood clotting activity by increasing clotting factor number seven as much as animal fats do. Okay, I, was, I think I was eating when I typed this, so my typing, I have a couple typos there. Sorry about that. Okay, but here's the point. Olive oil, the so-called wonderful olive oil, was increasing clotting factor number seven just as much as animal fats. So it's prothrombotic, okay? That's bad. Vegetable oils, they increase the risk of leaky gut, increased intestinal permeability, which also can let the bacterial endotoxins, LPS from gram-negatives, LTA from gram-positives, into the bloodstream, and that postprandial endotoxemia increases clotting predisposes you to clotting. That's all bad. 
Um, high fat diets themselves can cause the red blood cells to stick together. Rouleau formation, blood sludge, okay? High fat diets also, on separate lectures I've talked about this. So basically what I'm saying is Pritikin figured out a ton of stuff. McDougall went farther with it and I believe I'm also going a little farther in terms of some of the understanding of molecular biology. The high fat meals would cause the neutrophils to secrete MPO, myeloperoxidase, and the myeloperoxidase was positively charged, very cationic. It would bind with a negatively charged endothelial glycocalyx, sugar coating on top of the arterial lining, and the positive charges interacting with the negative charges would cause the endothelial glycocalyx to collapse down. The endothelial glycocalyx had a negative charge on it, a zeta potential is the name for that negative charge. And once it collapsed down, beneath it were exposed these um, adhesive molecules like vascular cell adhesion molecule, which increase the risk, and other adhesion molecules, increase the risk of red blood cells clotting um, <clears throat> clotting and sticking to the wall of the artery, as well as the white blood cells sticking to the wall of the artery and potentially getting into the subendothelial space, causing more inflammation. So what I'm saying is it's bad. Human digestive system is not made to eat high-fat foods on a routine basis. Yes, our ancestors, if they were starving, they would eat animal foods to get them through a cold winter. Yes, if they were starving and had no other food, they would eat them. That is true. But the default setting is to eat plant foods, and our metabolic system works much, much, much better with that. Okay, uh, Dr. McDougall continues. Vegetable oils also impair circulation, resulting in a 20% reduction in oxygen. The reduced oxygen circulation can lead to angina, you know, cardiac-related chest pain, impaired brain function, makes you stupid, brain fog, and fatigue, page 136. And here's the reference for that, because that's a pretty important statement. I actually showed the graph from the study in my last uh, part, I think in part four, or maybe part three. Peter Quo, the cardiologist in Pennsylvania, and the paper is the effect of lipemia upon coronary and peripheral arterial circulation in patients with essential hyperlipemia. And that's a big deal, that's a big statement. The reason why that's such a big deal is if you're causing like a 20, 15 to 20% drop in oxygen delivery to the tissues, you're moving towards pushing that tissue into a Warburg effect. Uh, Warburg-Warburg effect <clears throat> can cause that cancer cell, can cause the cell to become a cancer cell. Um, Roy Swank got up to 30% drop in oxygen delivery when fed a high fat meal to hamsters, for example, in the brain tissue. Not only that, but when you <clears throat> drop the oxygen delivery to a tissue in an immune system cell, you can sort of accelerate aging in those immune cells. That's like the research of Maria Middlebrun, who showed that when the mitochondria were injured in your lymphocytes, they no longer were uh, anywhere near as well functioning. They would kind of go into this chronic inflammation that happens more with aging, and they called it inflammation aging, inflammaging, inflammaging. Okay, so anyways, the reason I show you this is this is a landmark paper, Quo's paper, and here it is from the American Journal of Medicine, 1959. And <clears throat> similar follow-up papers were done related to this, including the work of Meyer Friedman and Ray Roserman, the two ophthalmologists. And they would put an 80-fold magnifying glass on the eyeballs and see uh, blood vessels, in a sense, the flow just disappearing because all these red cells were stuck together and ruled flow and it was going into vasospasm. It was a big mess. Um, and that's a key thing because this, this concept that I'm sharing with you, it sounds simple, it sounds obvious, but I guarantee you conventional medicine does not know this. And this is like one of the most important things you could know about blood flow. You have to know about zeta potential. You have to know about blood sludge because once you get that, then you get it why it's so important to avoid these high fat meals. And uh, this is the whole atherothrombosis theory of atherosclerosis. Gregory Sloop is the big pioneer of uh, atherothrombosis theory. So uh, I'm, I'm giving you the stage of the, of the big fundamental knowledge that you can understand this stuff so no one could BS you. Okay, uh, Dr. McDougall continues. The nuts and seeds are too rich for every day. Nuts and seeds have about 80% of calories from fat. That's a lot of fat, 80% of calories from fat. Whereas grains and legumes have only about 5 or 10% of calories from fat. So those are good foods. Soybeans have about 40% of calories from fat. That's a big statement right there. Soybeans have 40% of calories from fat. In other sources, I've seen it be 37% of calories from fat. That's a ton of fat. He also says the traditional families like in Japan or China who ate some soy, they would eat locally grown soy, organic soy, and they would eat less than 5% of their daily calories from soy. That's not like people in westernized country where they're eating lots of soy and it's, it's GMO soy sprayed with all kinds of stuff, processed with hexane, for example. 
Okay, um, <clears throat> Dr. McDougall continues. Indulging in fat-filled nuts and seeds brings about oily skin and excessive weight gain. Okay, later on he's going to point out that if somebody's really trying to lose weight, they want to avoid all the high-fat foods, including all the high-fat plant foods. Um, and then when he talks about vitamin B12, this is on page 169, he says, methylcobalamin and hydroxycobalamin are better choices for vitamin B12 than cyanocobalamin. I'm always afraid the cyano component might accumulate, and I think you know what that is. So I would only take these two. I, I just take methylcobalamin as a habit, and I found that to work quite well. done that for many years. Okay, <clears throat> Dr. McDougall continues. Salt and sugar are the scapegoats of the Western diet. We're on page 171 now of starch solution. He says, decreasing dietary sodium from 4,000 milligrams today, per day <clears throat> to 2,300 milligrams per day only lowers systolic blood pressure about one to five points, diastolic one to three. So hardly any. <clears throat> At the max, you're going to get a five milligram drop on top, which is <clears throat> not much. Okay, but just to let you know, there's another opinion here. This Dr. McDougall, Dr. Kempner, for example, felt there's a threshold effect, and you start seeing much more benefits as you keep bringing the sodium down close to what, you know, a native indigenous population person would eat in the ballpark of 200 to 500 milligrams. Okay, <clears throat> with, um, and by the way, the Dr. Kempner book is at the Dr. McDougall website. So you, you just go there and you can get his book. You can also get... Uh, Nathan Pritikin's legacy book. So I, I read both of them. I went to McDougal's site. I spent a ton of time there. It was time well spent reading those books. It was also kind of funny because Dr. McDougal had said, if anybody wants to talk to me, they had better read Kempner and um, Pritikin first. Don't waste my time talking to me unless you've read Kempner and Pritikin and Burkett. Okay, so I read all those guys. You know, so uh, I actually communicated a little bit with Dr. Um, McDougal through email about some of these things. Um... And you know I was like a star McDougaler for uh, his uh, nutrition advice many years earlier before that. Okay, so Dr. McDougall continues. With the McDougall diet, the average systolic blood pressure will decrease by 15 points in just one week. Okay, so what he's really saying here is you don't need to worry so much about sodium. Just follow my diet and your, and your systolic pressure will drop like 15 in one week on average. And so he's emphasizing the fact that his diet is low fat, and so that helps to lower blood pressure, but also the fact that once you start eating plants, you're automatically, P for plants, P for potassium, the vasodilator, plus you get magnesium. Magnesium is in the center of chlorophyll, plus you get the nitrates, the precursors to make nitric oxide. So you get all the stuff that helps improve your, your blood pressure just by eating the plant foods. So you don't need to worry that much about sodium. Dr. McDougall continues. Vegetarians tend to have low blood pressures regardless of how much salt they consume. Um, a plant food diet of starches with fruits and vegetables provides about 200 to 500 milligrams per day of sodium, which is plenty. Oh, he's also saying you don't have to worry about being too low in sodium. He says if you're eating a plant-based diet, you're not going to be that low in sodium. <clears throat> and that's in comparison to Kempner, who did additional things. Like he would rinse the white rice, try to make sure it was a low uh, salt brand of white rice. And so he could really get sodium down much lower, much lower. And in his case, you had to monitor the patient because his dietary sodium intakes were so low that was potentially risky for some patients. Okay, Dr. McDougall continues. You got to let people put a little salt and sugar on their plant foods or they won't eat them. Better to add a little salt to the surface of the food because that will contact your tongue directly and you can taste it rather than putting it into the cooking where you don't taste it so much and you have the potential to add much more without realizing it. Okay, then he continues. Some people are sensitive to salt, and even from relatively small amounts, they can get you know swelling and swollen feet, for example. Okay, now here's a big statement from Dr. McDougall. Fat is the real culprit in weight gain and illness. Fat is the real culprit in weight gain and illness. Like you said, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. So you don't want to be fat, eat low-fat starches. White rice... Potatoes, sweet potatoes are all 1% of calories from fat. That's as low as it gets. Dr. McDougall continues. Populations that eat the most starch have the lowest rates of type 2 diabetes. Okay? They also have the lowest rates of obesity and very low hypertension, almost no autoimmune disease. Like I showed you that graph previously, low-fat plant-based diet, you're low in all the chronic Western diseases because you're eating a totally different diet. Okay, Dr. McDougall continues. Dietary sugar does not cause type 2 diabetes. That's an important point. Diabetes is a f disease caused by excessive fat intake, not by excessive sugar intake. So he says it again. Dietary sugar does not cause type 2 diabetes. 
Okay, then he says, the main problem with excessive simple sugars is elevated blood triglycerides, which, which can increase your risk of MI and stroke. High fructose corn syrup is especially prone to causing hyperlipidemia, elevated blood uric acid. He also says your excess amounts of simple sugars can cause dental cavities. Large amounts of fructose do cause increased triglycerides and blood cholesterol. Okay. <clears throat> You'll sometimes hear about athletes like Kipchoge, the world record holder in the marathon, putting lots of uh, simple sugars into his iced tea. But you got to remember, that guy's running 26 miles. A regular person, you know, is going to sit at a desk all day working, okay? Uh, they're not running 26 miles, all right? Okay, um, next thing. He says, to lose weight, it's best to eat more veggies, avoid all simple sugars, including dried fruits, limit fruits to one or two per day, avoid all high-fat plant foods, which means avoid nuts, avoid seeds, avocados, soy, and olives. The only thing in there that I saw is a little controversial is um, about the simple sugars because there are some people who eat lots of fruits that are really skinny, and there are some people who intentionally eat simple sugars and they find that that doesn't affect their weight or even helps them to lose weight. So I'm not going to get into all that now, but I, I will tell you, you know, Dr. McNugle knows more about food than anybody else in the world. And in his opinion, this was relevant because he felt the fruits don't satisfy hunger so much. You've got the fructose, which is metabolized differently than glucose. But I'm just letting you know that was his recommendation for losing weight. He goes into a little more detail, you know, exercise more, better to eat several small meals than one real big meal if you're trying to lose weight. So I think that's about it for my book review of Start Solution. Yeah, so that's it. Um, it's an all-time landmark classic book on nutrition. It's one of the all-time best nutrition books. So I just hit the highlights of it. There's a lot more information in the book, a lot more, lots and lots of stuff in there and scientific references and deeper explanations and all that. But I just real quick wanted to give you the sense of everything and uh, kind of was a motivator for me to read the whole thing again myself. So anyways, hope that was helpful.